let's get started with the administration. As you see here, there are four modules that is part of us in the essentials. The bottom one is the administration. When you click that, what you land on is the administration module, which gives you various options. In addition to the administration module permissions that the administrator has access to, they also have the ability to manage the library aspects of it. What is a library? All the commonly repeated uh, data, the master data, would be usually captured in the library so that anytime anybody wants to use a specific data and we want to maintain consistency and uh, less error prone, we would be entering all that information in library so that it can be reused. Now let's get started with the first part of it, that is system configuration. System configuration, as the name suggests, it contains all the settings that are required for an administrator to manage settings that, are, that have an impact across the application, across the system rather. What are the things that are under system configuration as the screenshot suggests and as well as the notes, the on-screen text suggests? It helps you perform various options such as settings related to overall application, settings related to the authentication and login aspects, some workflow related settings, mobile settings, and GIS. This is specific to the maps. In this slide, you, you are seeing three elements, right? One is the visual representation and then some of the bullet points that talk to you about what exactly am I going to demonstrate as a trainer? And the box that you see at the right at the bottom, this is the references to the training guide. The training guide gives them the additional information. This gives you a detailed information about all the functionalities that we have, both functional as well as administration specific. In the table of content, you see a first section which helps them get started with essentials. This guide is very important for anybody to read through and understand any functionality in detail. Just to give you an example, I was talking to you about system configurations. If you want to know what each field in that particular form signifies, when you click that, it will take you to that particular section where a screenshot reference would be given, and each of these fields will be described in detail in the table here. So as a learner, in addition to the application directly, if you want to read more about it, the description is given in detail in the guide itself. So this is the environment that I would be demonstrating. I would definitely recommend you to follow along when you have to do a guided practice alongside me when I'm talking about the functional modules. But now also, if it makes you feel comfortable, feel free to use your build as well. But ensure that you are following through what I'm explaining because that is also important as you are seeing your screen. I'm just logging in. In the home page, Essentials Build has these four modules available. Home module, we have the projects module where all the projects and contracts related to it are maintained. And the bottom two modules that you see are specific to administrators. Library is the module that I just spoke, spoke to you about. This is the catalog of reusable information that is maintained and reused at any time. And then the administration is very specific to administrators. No other roles will have permission to view this module. Essentials is configured in such a way that the roles and permissions are predefined for essentials. So how essentials is built? We have configured certain roles. We have configured permissions for each of those roles. So what roles are permission to what modules is already configured in permissions form. And based on their visibility, they will see the modules and forms within those each module. What does this dot signify? That is the, the bottommost level in the hierarchy. The first one is the folder. When you expand the folder, it doesn't have any functionality. As you see, there is no clickable option here. So when you click it, it expands a, a bunch of forms within that. When you have a plus sign, this is not really a folder. It is a form. It's just that it has for subcategories within that. And when you click it, this is the bottommost level in the hierarchy. It opens up the actual form. I did introduce you to a term called single instance and multi instance. Single instance means there is only one instance of the record of a particular form. So when I click application settings, what I land on is a single instance form. So anytime I open this form, this is the record that shows. There is only one instance of that record. If I make any changes to it, it will change the default setting that we have set for ourselves initially. When I say multi instance, I click user accounts, it lands on a list page. So these are multiple instances of records related to user accounts. 
So each instance has its own details page. So if I want to maintain multiple instances of user accounts, I can create those and maintain it in a list page. So a multi-instance is a, is, a, is a form that maintains a list of records and each record will have its own set of details. Whereas a single instance means there are no multiple variations of that same record. It's just that one record. And if you change it, the previous record gets overwritten. That's what I mean by single instance and multi-instance. Most of the administration related forms are single instance forms. As you keep, as I keep clicking, these are all single instances. When I click the form, it directly loads on the details page. So if I change it, it will change the, it will overwrite the previous record. Whereas few, few other forms that are part of administration, like user accounts, security roles, these are multi-instance forms though. You can have multiple records saved as part of your security roles. So there are a series of forms under system content. First is application settings. You have a bunch of fields here. What are these? Application name, Origo Essentials. When you see here, this is the name here in that particular tab. Whatever you type here is the name of the application. If you make any changes here and save, it will reflect here. But as administrators, we need to be extremely careful of what we are making changes to here because it will have an impact across the application. I'll tell you the significance as I explained before with the further uh, fields. Second field is allowed file types. So what it is, there is a tooltip which says when allowed file type is modified, kindly contact system administrator to define, update the viewer for the modified file types and viewer mapping. Viewer is a document viewer. What does a document viewer do? It helps you view the different types of documents that you have uploaded within the system. What kind of documents can you upload? You can upload a, a PowerPoint material, you can upload an Excel file, you can upload an image file. All those have different extensions. So what is allowed to be uploaded within Masterworks is what you're giving here. These are all the different extensions that are allowed to be uploaded within Masterworks. Anything beyond this, system will stop you from uploading. This is to ensure that there is a security measure. If somebody is trying to upload an EXE file which contains a virus, Masterworks will not even let you logging in because as administrators, you are restricting it by providing what are the extensions that can be uploaded within Masterworks. And then comes your allowed document size and attachment. Now we talked about what are the different types of files that can be uploaded. Now we are saying that how big a file can be when I'm uploading a file to ensure that we are not uploading some files which are in gigabytes. It will slow down the system. Sometimes it might impact the storage capacity of the system as well, of the environment as well. So what we have given here is 1110 megabytes. And then we have mail configurations. These are Server details, mail, SM, SMTP server details. These are provided by Origo. Typically, people don't change it. When uh, this is pretty much why we enter it is if any user ID gets added, would you want that user to be notified by an email? Or if any notification, any workflow notification need to be sent out as an email in addition to some my task notification that is sent out within Masterworks, any email related information that has to go out or come in there needs to be a mail configuration setup between Masterworks and an SMTP server. That is what is configured here. And if any email has to go out of Masterworks, if I receive an email from Masterworks, under what email ID am I receiving that email? That is what you're providing here, admin at audio. So if a user ID gets created, that, e that user ID has an, has an email ID provided, when it is a success, that email ID will receive an email. From whom will it receive an email? from admin at Oracle. All right, so that is mail configuration. And if I go down, this is regional configuration. Regional configuration, again, the time zone, how essentials, time, what time zone would you want the application to be set in? So this is the time zone. These are various time zones. Right now it is set to central time zone. The customer wants to change it, they can change it. But once they change it, they need to ensure, they, they need to keep in mind that Everywhere when you are generating a report, any subscribing to any report, the report generation would be following the new time zone. When a record gets created, how the record timestamp is added will be following the new time zone. Okay. So this is time zone, amount format. You can see the tooltip here, number of digits after decimal. Across the application, you would have come across budget estimate amount, contract amount. So you would see that if there is any decimal point, after that, how many digits you want to have. If you want to have only restricted to only two decimals or two 
the digits after decimal, you have the ability to put it here. Quantity, quantity typically, we put it as a whole number. If you still want to have any fractions to be added after that, number of digits after decimal, you can do so. By default, we have set it as zero. That means we can put it as 10 or 20, not 20.5. It's 20 or 21 or 22, like that. There is no decimal point for quantity as of now. Unit price, similar to amount for each quantity, what is the unit price? If you want to have digits after decimal, you can set it up here. Date format, like how there are various date formats available. For this environment, we have put it as month, mm, dd, and yy.1. Mm -hmm. So that's the date format. So when a date stamp is getting recorded in essentials, in this format is when, is, is how the dates would get stored. Date separator is a forward slash. We have hyphen and we have dots as well, but we, we have set it up as forward slash. Time field format, again, these are all timestamps that get stored in my, the uh, application. How would you want it to get stored is what you are setting it up here. So as I mentioned earlier, whatever we are doing it here in this particular form has an impact across the application. That is why the name itself says application settings. So the next form in system configurations is authentication and login settings. So as the name suggests, this form, you enter all the details related to the authentication of the server when it comes to the credentials in which you log in. How, your, how does your credential get authenticated and authorized? All of those is what you are entering here. Login mode, we have three modes, external identity provider, masterworks, or mixed. It is right now setting it as set, set up as masterworks. What it means is if a customer has an external IDP server, and if you want essentials to be integrated with that server, what it does is in addition to having a Masterworks user account to log in, they can provide their own company's login credentials to log into essentials. So that's the external, it can be an ADFS server, it can be an Azure AD server or anything for that matter. If that has to be that kind of a configuration setup, we have the ability to do so. But the build that I'm showing you currently the login mode is set to masterworks. That is why when you log out and re-log in, you only have the option to log in using the essentials login ID. So I have to have a user account within the application for me to log into the system. If I do not have a credential within application, if I have a credential that is what I use for logging into any of my companies. SharePoint server or anything. If I want to use that to log into the essential system as well, that external IDP has to be enabled. Now let me talk about the other options. Reset password timeout in seconds. Basically, if I am opting, uh, if uh, any user is opting to reset their password, they would receive an email with a link which they can click in to reset their password. If they don't act on that link, that link has to expire within a certain period of time period. If you put that say, section uh, time here, if you say 48 seconds, in this case, when a user is asking to reset their password and the recent password, reset password link is sent to them over an email, if they don't act on that link for 48 seconds, the link will be disabled. They would have to request for another link. This is in seconds. If you want to change it, you can change it. Again, it's the customer's whatever they have, they want to set it up for their organization, they can do so. But when we are providing the essentials as an out-of-the-box option, these are the options that we set it up and give it to them. Session timeout notification, this is another important thing. When you are, like now I am logged into this session. Let's say I'm continuing to talking to you for an hour or so. The session has to time out at some point for the person to re-log in, right? Before the session gets timed out, there has to be some kind of a notification to the user telling them that your session is going to be timed out. Do you want to continue in this session or you want to let it time out? So that notification message, when should it come? Should it come 30 seconds before the session is going to get timed out actually? Should it come a minute before the session has to be, your session will time out? That's what you're mentioning here. You put 30 seconds, that pop-up window will come for the user to take an action on 30 seconds before the session is going to actually get timed out. If they don't act on that pop-up as well, there will be a counter within this. Session is going to get timed out in 30 seconds, 29, 28. There will be a you know, countdown. 
So by the time it reaches 20, zero seconds, if you don't act on the pop-up as well, the session will get tagged. That is what we are providing here. And then comes your password configurations. These are very uh, self-explanatory. Minimum password length, would you want it to be six digits? Must include lowercase characters, uppercase, must include numbers, special characters, all of this. User ID or past part of the user ID should not be part of the password if you want to enforce that. Let's say my user ID is trainer one. And if I don't want the password also to contain those words, you can enforce that as well. If your default password has to expire 90 days. So anytime you set a password, default password expiration period in 90 days means if there is a default password set when the account got created and you are continuing to use the same password, the system has to enforce you to change it after a certain number of days. That days is what you're providing here. If you do not want the password to expire at all, you want to let the user continue to use the default password that was set for them, you can select the checkbox so that the system will never enforce them to change their password. The next comes user must change the password at first log on. What does this indicate? This is important aspect when let's say you as an administrator are importing 20, 30 users in bulk, right? So there is a bulk import of user accounts within the system. So when the bulk import happens, there will be a default password that will be set for each of those user accounts. Let's say 20 user accounts got imported using an Excel import within the user accounts form. For those 20 users, there will be a default password set up. So when any of those 20 users are provided the credentials and they log in for the first time, the system will enforce them to change it so that the password is their own. Once they change it to their own, then they can continue to work on the system. The next one is enforce password history. If you want to enforce that the previously used three passwords, you do not want to repeat it, or two passwords, you do not want to repeat it, you can put the number here. So if it is not defined, you can keep using the same password. It's just that you are change the password, but enter the same one. If you are entering it here, let's say instead of not define and put two here, whatever password I was using previously, I cannot use it for the next two times. All right, the next one is login attempt configurations, maximum login attempts. What, is it, what does this indicate? If somebody is trying to log into the system multiple times with the wrong credentials, when do they get locked out? Maximum, they can try three times, four times. In this case, it says nine. So after nine times, they can keep entering a wrong credential to try to log in. Beyond the ninth time, system will log them out. They cannot log in again. For them to do so, how will they unlock themselves? They have two options. Either they just wait it out for 60 minutes and then try again, or reach out to the administrators. The administrators can unlock the accounts for them. So if they are going the first route, they're just going to wait it out. How long can they wait out? That's what we are putting it in the second field. Reset unsuccessful login attempt counter in minutes. So 60 minutes after ninth attempt, if the account gets locked out, they can wait for 60 minutes and try logging in again. If they have found the right password and credential, they can wait for 60 minutes. The account will get unlocked on its own. Then they can try logging in with the new password. Then their counter gets reset. Again, they can continue to try for nine times. After the ninth time of wrong login, system gets locked out. These are the settings that you need to be aware of when it comes to authentication and login settings. Workflow settings, it's less number of fields. I'll quickly go through each of them. What it says is maximum size of document to attach during workflow action. What does this indicate? If you are in any record, or let's say you're trying to act, you're trying to perform a workflow action, right? At that time, when you're when you click a workflow, a pop-up window comes up. When the pop-up window comes up, you have three options there. One, you you provide uh, any message that you want to provide for that action to be completed. You can provide set a deadline, and you also can upload some support documents. What it indicates is if you have a workflow and you're trying to perform a workflow, you will get a pop-up window. In that pop-up window as well, if you are trying to approve a record, you want to add some approval email or approval document along with that approval action. That document that you're uploading, do you want to limit the size of that document that you're uploading at that time? Then you can provide the limit here. Please note that this limit will override the limit that you have set up at the application settings. Let's say in the application settings, you have put only 10 MB. So across the application, when you are uploading a document, you can upload up to 10 MB per file. 
But if you put here as 100 MB, this will override the application level settings so that at the workflow stage, if any document needs to be uploaded, that document can have up to 100 MB per document, which will override the 10 MB that you would have set to at the application level. That's the first field. Second one is default mail body template for workflow notification. So these mail body templates are configured in library. So what does it indicate? When a workflow action has to be, let's say I have created a record and I submitted it and it comes to you. How will you know that you need to take an action? There are two ways. You will get a notification in my tasks within the application and you will get an email that there is an action pending on you. So when that email comes to you, first of all, how will you get an email if, my, if the application has the email configuration set properly? That's what we did in application settings. Second question, how will you receive an email if you are the appropriate stakeholder? Your email ID has to be properly listed down in the user account. That's another thing that we looked at. The third thing is, on what format will that email come to you? Will it just give you a notification saying that you have received an email? There has to be a format. That format is what you are defining in the library as part of your mail body template. So you can create a number of templates. We have a default mail body template that we can select here. So the other option that I was telling you, if I go to library, mail body templates, in here, you can define these different mail body templates. This is the default mail template. So if I am editing that, hello, Origo Essentials user, please check your task list for the new task related to, these are dynamic fields, okay? For any record, these dynamic fields will get populated in the project, so on, so Click here to more details. There is a hyperlink as well. This is a rich text field, right? You can put hyperlinks, you can put an image, whatever you want. So this is how the default mail body template is set up. And when an email has to go, for a workflow notification, this is the format in which it will go. Now I have set up the default template. So whenever a workflow notification has to go, this will go in this template. Next thing is default days to complete an action. I have put it as two. So when I'm performing a workflow action by default, it is not an enforcing mechanism. It's just that it's a guideline. You have two days to complete the workflow action. Even if you miss it, there's nothing going to happen, but it's a guideline that you want to set it up. So anybody who receives the workflow uh, that they need to perform, they will also come to know how many days do I have to complete this action, right? So this is default day. You can override it. Anytime you want to perform an action, you can override this number by putting it as one day or five days, whatever you want to. When you're performing that actual action, when you are, the pop-up comes up, you can provide your a message there. You can provide how many days you want to give for that action to be completed by the next stakeholder. And you can attach any additional documents you want to and click confirm. So that is the number that is coming up here. Next thing is send a reminder prior to due date. It's a checkbox. If you clear the checkbox, the options go off. These two options go off. But we have set it up. What it indicates is, let's say your due date to complete an action is five days from now. And you want to send a reminder two days before the actual due date comes up. So on the third day, your system will send a notification saying that you have a task due, you have only two days to complete it, please go ahead and do so. So how many days before the due date is achieved would you want to send an email? Two days before the due date is achieved. Do you want to send an email with the proper template? You can provide that too. So a general email, notification email can have a proper a particular temp, body template. A reminder email can have a different template. A past due email can also have a different template. All of that you can define in the, the mail body template that I showed you, and you can pick that up from here. The past due date is what is coming here. If I clear the checkbox, that goes off. If I select it, the template would come up. What it indicates is, let's say you have your prior due date notification, but the, per, the stakeholder has not taken any action. The due date has passed. Once the due date has passed, would you want to send notifications to them? that you have missed your due date, every day you will get a notification that you have to take an action on. So that means, would you want that mail to be with a different message? Then you can configure that mail body as well. Select the template here so that the system will send due date, past due date reminders to, this, to the stakeholders every day. The last one is show workflow history and details report. 
what it indicates is let me open it in in any workflow in any particular uh, details report for example this is the project right i'm opening a project interstate highway and in this project let's say i have project fund list a project fund list has to go through a series of workflows now if i want to view a details report of this particular record it will show the report of all the details that are part of this particular report, which is the fund list. In addition to it, do I also want to see the workflow history? So these are all the details of the project fund list, which is coming as a report. In addition, it is also showing the workflow history in the same report. Do you want it to be shown or do you not want it to be shown? If you want it to be shown, then you would have selected that particular checkbox here. If this checkbox was not selected, this report would have showed only this much. It wouldn't have showed the workflow history. So that is what it means. So these are some of the settings that you would do as part of your workflow settings. The next is mobile settings. Mobile, it's, a, it's just a single uh, line. You have your desktop version or a, a web server version, and you have your mobile version. Mobile version is an offline version. You can work on it offline as well. So that means the, the form design, the records, everything need to be downloaded in a mobile cache memory for it to access it when it is in when it is accessed in an offline mode, right? So that cache needs to be rebuilt on a periodic basis. So every 24 hours, this will get rebuilt. As you see here, last cache was successfully built, built on 4-26-2021 at a particular time. So that is a day from yesterday around some time. So every 24 hours, this will get rebuilt automatically. But let's say a form's layout has changed. Somebody has gone into the form, added a new field, or added a new workflow. Something has happened to that form. That needs to be immediately reflected in the mobile version as well. So you have a manual enforcement of rebuilding the cache here. Next, GIS settings. This form is, as I mentioned, if I go to the, the guide in itself, it gives you a clear explanation on all the forms. Geographic information system as it is expansion. It, it is an information database. It, it usually captures all type of spatial and geographical information. GIS server, how must or our essentials is integrated with GIS server so that whenever we are trying to map, mark a location about a project or a contract, how does it get served in the server? And when we retrieve it, how does it come back? All the settings related to that is what we configure here. As you see here, GIS in mobile, enabling GIS in mobile. We have a mobile application as you know. Some forms which have the map layout within the form, for example, issue log. Issue log is a form that has a map layout within it so that people can mark where the issue is exactly in that project location. So for those kind of forms, if it is enabled for mobile, Will the location grid also be enabled for mobile? So that is when you select this checkbox. Enable O authorization. This piece is specific to O authentication for, again, the GIS enablement. So as you see here, by enabling OAuth for GIS authentication, you are allowing the OAuth authentication between essentials and GIS system for integration. So that is the OAuth uh, enablement. And then if I go down, there is a grid called base maps. What does this indicate? When I go to a locations form, in this case, I am going to a locations form here. This is a project, actual project, where I'm navigating to the location form. In here, if I create a new location record, you will see the maps loading here, right? So we have based by default, there is a map that load. This is the street map. In addition, we have a few other maps are available, topographic map, terrain map. So these maps, based on how the user wants to view the map and then mark the layout on the map location, we have these maps configured. Where do we configure it? This is where we configure it. If I go here and edit it, you will know how the URL, these URLs are all coming from the customers. They know their GIS server details. They provide that information. What type of maps do they want us to load? These URLs, we would get it from them and we would store it. By At any point, we can only mark one of these maps as default so that Whenever a, a location or a map grid is opened in any of these forms, the default map view is what is loaded in the map. As you see here, street map was marked as default. 
So by default, the street map is loaded here. If I go down, these are called as layers. What are these layers? In addition to the maps, do I want to capture any additional layers? Some customers might have some key projects that they have. For example, if there is a pipeline project, pipeline customer, they would have pipelines built in across their various locations in the country. And those are very private information. So they would be maintaining their own private layers, which are sit sitting on top of an existing map. So those maps, again, they would be providing us the information. The customers would provide us the information. So how would I get that information? When I try to add that information, I provide the name for the layer. Again, this URL is coming from the RGIS server. Some authentication for even a person, a user to even access that layer. Do I need to provide any authentication so that there is a proper authentication enabled for somebody to even access that layer? Password, confirm user ID is provided here. Do you want this layer to be editable? What does this mean? You can have editable layers, non-editable layers. Non-editable layers are nothing but the layers that the customers provide us where we will just load it. It will be a read-only layer. I will see where all the locations of the customer is available. That's a read-only layer, which is layered on top of the original base map. And then on top of that, if I want to mark something, those layers would want to call it as enabled uh, edit, editing. You want to mark it as enable editing. When you do that, what happens is, as you see here, roads, buildings, bridges, these are layers which are editable layers. If I want to mark roads on the map, how, how would I mark it? I would mark it by means of line or polyline geometry. Transparency, I'll tell you what it means. So if I enable any of these layers, what it indicates is these layers will lie on top of the existing map. And if I want to make it editable, I select the bridges. These are the controls that are coming for me. So bridges means I can mark a bridge location right here like this, or I can mark a squared pattern. This, this area is a bridge, or I can just select any of these controls that we want to, we can mark all of these things. Once I put this information, this is a, these are the controls that are associated to a bridge layer. If I go to buildings, buildings are mostly locations. So if I just mark it, this is a location where there is a building. So likewise, I can mark the locations in the map. And if I am going on roads, roads typically you would mark it by means of line or freehand writing. So if I put a line from here to here, this is the location of this project. Likewise, I can do all of this. How these controls are associated to the respective geometry associated to each of these layers. Why would we put 50% as a transparency? Because this is sitting on top of the map. If I put 100% transparency, there will not be any trans translucent layer, the transparency in this particular object. You will not be able to see what is behind an actual map. So these are 50% transparent layers that we are adding. This way, we can add any number of layers. These are editable layers. You can have non-editable layers, which are coming from customers. So what typically uh, anybody who marks locations, they would select the map, they would enable the customer provided layers. Once the layer is sitting on top of the car, original map. Then if I want to make any edits to it, or if I want to mark a building or a road or a bridge on top of it, you have the ability to do so as well. So this is how the layers are configured. Layer analysis, save the form to see updated list of non-editable layers. So what does this mean? When I go here, I click this, you see this pop-up. This pop-up is giving you some kind of a tooltip information, project name. So this tooltip information is a quick view of that particular location uh, element that we have added. So for you to come up with this name, project name, this is not coming from the database. This is coming from the actual database field might be saying as P and name, name. So that is how the, that particular attribute is saved in the database. But for you to be readable, you might need to give some allies for that particular database column. So that is what you're providing here. So this project name is coming, is an allies for the actual name that is fetched from the GIS layer. These are the aliases that you'll be providing here. Next comes the map location. When I loaded this location form, there was a boundary by which the map was loaded, correct? How does map the essential application know that 
the map has to be loaded from this latitude to this la longitude location. This coordinates. By default, if I zoom out, more map is shown. If I zoom in, it is coming closer to a particular area. But by default, there has to be a boundary on which the map has to be loaded, right? That is what you're providing as your default, uh, default map coordinates. Zoom level is 16. Y coordinate, X coordinate, you're providing based on which the map is loaded by default. Server authentication. This is the ArcGIS server detail coming from the customer. You provide all that information. Beyond this, the geometry service URL. If I go to the guide, again, it's a technical field. What does that indicate? So if you see here, these are the aliases that we talked about. And as I scroll down, you have that particular field. Configured geometry service settings. In this section, we are just providing the URL defined in the ESRI server to support any spatial reference other than the default spatial reference that we have maintained. So anything other than what we typically refer to from the ESRI layer on your map, you can provide that URL. Again, it's a very technical term. The technical folks from Oregon will be able to work with the technical experts from the customer side to configure this information. Where do we configure it is where we are seeing currently. So, so far we have seen all the details related to the web server. But you also saw if we can enable this for mobile. So in the mobile device, you would still have to provide some details related to the mobile device, right? So that is what you're doing it here. In the offline map, would you want to provide the same coordinates so that the map when it loads in the mobile device, it is showing the same thing what, you, what it would show in the web server. So you're providing the coordinates for X and Y. Start coordinate and end coordinate. Offline also has some maps, base maps. In this case, the offline uh, mobile device has only one map and that is marked as default. That is the street map. How do you configure it? Like how I showed you for the web server. You can provide the name of the map, URL, from level and to level based on which the, the map is loaded. And ESRI save settings, what does this indicate? When I save a location, in this case, I have added all this information. When I save it, that detail that I just entered through the Essentials application, the map on which I marked all those locations, that needs to be set in the GIS server of the customer. So the system will try to save this information in the GIS server of the customer. How many times can the system continue to try before it gives up and marks a log? Like you see here, for the first time when I tried it, it saved it in the Esri server. After that, a couple of instances, the record is not getting saved. So Esri save status is failed. When this happens, how many times it will keep trying before it gives up? So three times we have put. So if the three trials have expired, what will happen to the system? It will now go and mark a log in the Esri logs. Again, failure notification recipient, if the three times it failed, an ESRI log will get logged as well as an email will send, be sent. We have not provided an email. If an email address is provided, if the SMTP servers are configured properly, a notification, failure, failure, ESRI save failure notification will be sent to this particular email. So that takes us to the ESRI log form. Like I mentioned, we saw that a couple of times it failed. So the failure log is captured in here. The technical expert can come and see why the save process has failed. In this case, it says error while getting a response from our GIS. That means at some point the GIS server authentication had failed. That is why when we when Essentials was trying to save all the location details in the GIS server, there was no response from them. When the authentication connection was trying to get connected, there were it was not happening. So that's how the technical folks would be able to determine that what is the issue? Why was the map details not getting logged in GIS server? 